Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm happy to be in the house of the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to just quickly get into the lesson this evening. Um, just, you know, bear with me. I got a little bit of a congestion and a scratchy throat, but I want to get into the lesson this morning or this evening. Uh, just, just jump in real quickly, and, and I'm not going to try to keep you long. Uh, I, I know you see some pages up here, but as, as Brother Howell said the other night, it's more because I can't see, and I got to put the words real big so that I can see them on there. So, uh, uh, but I want to I want to jump in real quick, and um, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Second Samuel chapter 11. Most of you know the stories, and I'm not going to reiterate and go over through it, but I want to touch base on a couple of things. We're going to hit 2 Samuel 11, and then we're going to jump over to uh, chapter 12 real quick. 2 Samuel 11, chapter 12, I mean, verse uh, 12 and 15. Let me get there myself. And David said to Uriah, Terry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk, and that even went out and to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down unto his house. And when it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye uh, from him that he may be smitten and die. You could quickly turn over to chapter 12, verse 1. It said, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. He came and unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man was exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. And it did eat his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay at his bosom and was unto his as a daughter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take his own flock and of his own herd to dress for his wayfaring man that was come unto him but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed the king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives unto thy bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and Judah, and if it had been there, been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such as such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword and with the chil of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. <clears throat> and the Lord said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor and to they, and, and, they, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. The title of my message this evening is The Consequences of Sin. All right. Consequences of Sin. If you could pray with me, raise your hand. Yes. Let's ask the Lord for a fresh anointing this evening. Yes. Lord, as we come before you this evening, Lord, we lift you up and magnify your holy name. Lord, there is none greater than you, and we just thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you for the testimonies, and we thank you for the healing. We thank you for salvation and the blood that covers the multitude of sin, O oh God. 
But Lord, as we come to you this evening, I pray for this, this message to touch each and every heart. Lord, that we would turn away from the sin, the things that separate us from you, O oh God. And Holy Ghost, I pray for a fresh anointing, O oh God, that you would just rain down each and every one and rain down, O oh God, and let me be used by you this evening, O oh God, to glorify your name. Lord, we come before you to praise and honor you again. In the wonderful holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I titled this lesson, The Consequences of Sin. I went back multiple times, I'm back and forth, I'm asking the Lord, and Brother Corey had called and asked if he said, would you be willing to preach? And I said, absolutely, I, I'll do my best. And uh, so I went back and I had uh, some notes and some things that I felt like the Lord had already given. And I had titled the message earlier, Sin is a Killer. But I want to try to go to you with this evening and, and kind of tell you there's three things that I really want to touch base with that sin is and what sin does. Sin is a hindrance to worship. Sin is a death sentence to each and every one. And sin will cause a separation between you and the Lord. And that's what we have to understand in those three things is that everything that we do and everything that we are is that God has a certain special plan for you and I. And that's not to live in sin, but to be overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? And as we see this and everything that we do, and I'm not going to cover everything again, but I want you to know, obviously, in the lesson that we have here with David, David had been anointed at an early age to be king over Israel. He had been uh, 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 looked over even as, as, as Samuel had come in and looked over his family and uh, everybody else was bigger, they were stronger, but he was after God's own heart and he anointed him to be king over Israel. David uh, uh, was a, a man that had killed lions, he had killed bears, he had, had done a, a multitude of things as, as a shepherd. He had uh, went out and uh, obviously when his brothers were, I'm really high up here brother Corey, uh, he went out to, uh, when he went to uh, uh, see his brothers as they were in battle and fighting Goliath, as the men of, of war were standing in the, in the bushes with their knees shaking, he was ready to fight, never giving up, ready to go in headlong, and he ended up killing Goliath with rocks and stones and, and cut his head off. David was also a man that uh, uh, had multitudes of, of military victories. If you go back into the Bible, the Bible in, in chapter 8 and 9 and 10 spe speaks specifically of the multitude of victories that David had. So David was a battle warrior. He knew exactly what he had. He knew exactly what he did. And he also knew that he was anointed by God to do certain things and to be in certain areas. But then we come to this place where David gets a little bit older in his age. He's got a little grayer in his beard. He's been battle tested time after time. And he come out victorious each and every time. But the reality of it is, is now David is getting a little bit weary. And this is something that I think a lot of the times that even Christians do. Is that we are in the battle and we're in the streets all the time. We're talking to people about what God has done and what God is doing. We talk to them about how God has brought us out and the things that He has. But I think a little bit times we get a little bit complacent with where we are sometimes. And when we get that complacency, we don't we lose a lot of things. We lose a lot of our prayer time. We lose a lot of our study time. We lose a lot of our fasting time. And we do a lot of things that we didn't used to do and maybe even had looked at things earlier and said, that's not something that I would do. But now when we get that complacency in Christ, we want to sit around and not do the things. We don't want to come to Sunday school. We don't want to come to Wednesday night service. We don't want to come to Sunday night service. We, you know, if, if, it's, if it's easier to stay at home, it's easier to stay at home. And I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm glad that you're here this evening. But I'm going to tell you, all you've got to do is go out and there's cars going up and down this road every day, every time church is out, and they're ready, they're ready to go to the, to, to the camp. They're ready to go fishing. They're ready to go out on the boat instead of coming and bringing the presence of the Lord. Amen? But I want you to understand is that we do these things is we come to serve Christ. Right. We didn't come to serve man, and I didn't come to, to, to tickle your ears this evening. I, I, this is a hard message of the consequences 
of sin. I wish I had a, a message that, you know, would just the, the shake the walls down. But sometimes we have to look at our own heart and our, look at our own self sometimes to find out, is there anything that is separating me from what God has in store for me? Am I the problem or is something else the problem? Because if there's a problem, then we need to remove it. But that consequence of sin will take you into a lot of places that you would never thought you would have gone. All you have to do is talk to people today. The addictions that people are going through and the, 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 just the, the whole uh, a spiritual warfare that is coming against people in every day. We're being inundated with our children. Our young children are being pushed into uh, classes of stuff that they should never even be a, a part of at a certain early age. Right. They're doing things in our schools and our high schools and our colleges that, that would make a grown man blush with some of the things that they're teaching. Oh, yeah. wow. And they're wanting our young people to, to be accepted of it. Okay. And, you know, and, and this is what I'll tell you this. I'm a little bit tired of all these other things being pushed and months of this and months of that. But see, the one thing that I am not tired of is being a child of the Most High God. That's right, yeah. The one thing that, you know, you can have a day, you can have a month, but serving Christ is every day. Right. It's in every day we should be championing that cause every day. Every, everybody wants to fly a flag. Well, I'm going to fly the flag of Christ and say that He is my Savior. He is my Redeemer. He's the one that I'm going to serve and not, not some uh, false doctrine that is being preached and taught in the world today. The world is trying to do nothing but cave in to the sin of the flesh. This word, this gospel, is being, uh, is being tried to be pushed back and forth even behind the pulpit of men and women that don't want to preach the truth. Right. This sin is a deadly word to the world right. because it separates them from the love of Christ. That's right. As we see here in this message, even David, who had done great works, had done those things that he had uh, uh, been championed about. There even in the, in the beginning, they used to sing the songs of, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. He had been a champion of everything that had been out there. He had been a champion of what God had needed him to do. Even as Saul had tried to kill him the multiple times, God had delivered him out of the hand of Saul and everything that he did. But yet in this occasion, David has stayed out of the battle. I'm going to tell you, this battle is an everyday battle that we're going to have to fight. If you're not understanding and you're not fighting a battle, then you need to look at yourself and go, am I doing what God has called me to do? Right. Because this is a battle every day. And we're fighting it not just in our families. We're fighting it in our churches. We're fighting it on our jobs. Amen. We're fighting it on people that we don't even know because there is sin and it's rampant in the world and it's only going to get worse. Amen. I'm here to tell you that you got to understand is if you read anything about this Bible is I believe at 51 years old, I've been saved since I was 20, 27 for 24 years that I don't, I've never seen as much sin being promoted as I've ever seen it now. Yeah. In these last years, we've seen nothing but sin being promoted over and over and over again. And anybody who stands up and stands firm for it, they want to, they want to, they will call it cancel culture. Yeah. They want to do those things that everybody wants to do. So as we see those things, as as David has as quit going out into the battle, take him a drink of water. David is going into battle, or he had stopped going into battle, and he had taken a stroll, went to the rooftop, and he had caught a glimpse of Bathsheba taking a bath. And instead of doing the things that he should have done, he continued to look. Right. He took Bathsheba, knew he was knew she was a wife of a, a his one of his soldiers Uriah and lay with her and she became pregnant so he brought Uriah back 
trying to cover up the sin. And once again, I said there's a sin of, uh, of, of that, that takes you away from God. Right. It, it separates you from what God wants you to do. Right. Sin also will take you into your praise and your worship. See, David was a, 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 a I mean, he played his heart to the point where, where Saul, and, and it was an ease to Saul's ear. But yet he, he was now, he wasn't doing those things. But once again, sin is also ultimately a killer. And so when sin had crept into David's heart and he had looked upon Bathsheba uh, with lustful eyes and he had slept with her and she became pregnant, he devised a plan that to, to I'm going to cover up the sin that has, has happened. I'm going to cover up the sin that has taken place. But I'm here to tell you, you can do a lot of things and you can cover it up from me. You can cover it up from Brother Eddie, Brother Corey, your wife, your husband, your mama, your daddy, your children, right. but you can't cover it up from the eyes of God. Right. But I will here to tell you one thing. Let me say this in this, this whole process. The only thing that can cover up the sin is the blood of Christ. That's, right. that's the only thing that's going to get you to cover up that sin is by pleading the blood of Christ and coming unto repentance. But the fact is, is that David tried to kill Uriah. He tried, or he tried to uh, 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 get him to cover the sin, to get him drunk, go, go be with your wife. He wouldn't do that. See, at this point in time, Uriah the Hittite was a better example than even David the anointed king. That's right. And he had done the things, and he wouldn't even go into his own wife, but he would rather be in the battle with his fellow men and women. Now, I'm going to here to tell you is that when you're in trouble... You need prayer warriors on your side. You don't need gossipers. You don't need, you don't need people that are going to go and tell your business. You need men and women who are willing to get into the battle. Fervently pray for everything. Pray without ceasing when I need a problem. The things that I need, that's who we need to have on our side. But David had taken this to a certain extent where he went into and, and even uh, a guy with Joab and said, here, I'm going to send Uriah back into the battle. And when I send him back into the battle... Pull back forth. They, or Uriah was even carrying his own death certificate right. to his own death that he had no idea what he was doing. But he was more faithful as, as, a, as a man than even David was at that time. Yeah. And then we have the story where we know, and I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know, is that Uriah was killed. Uh, David took the wife. But I want to talk to you about the sin that had happened. I want to talk to you about the things that had gone on to the fact is that now he had thought he had covered the sin. But here Nathan the prophet comes, talks to him all of the story, and he gets angry. Angry at the things that Nathan is saying. Angry at the things that, about this man that he was talking about. But then Nathan says, you are that man. That's right. yeah. I'm going to tell you, that's a, that's a tough, hard statement. To know is that when the prophet says, you are the man that the Lord is talking about. And so all the things that we see and all the things that we do, we've got to realize is that we have to be above the things that are causing us to sin. We've got to be above the things that our hearts are dealing with and all that. See, we were born with a sin nature. I don't know if you know that or not, but you and I were born with a sin nature and we have to do those things. And I'm going to tell you, in today's society in today's world. The only way that we're going to make it through is if we get born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and be on fire for God every day. We don't need to get complacent in the things that we do. We don't need to be complacent in who we are and say, I'm, I'm good. I've always said this, is that when I, I get to heaven, I'm never going to get to the Lord. And He says, you got too close to me. He's never going to say that. He's drawing us in in everything that we do and everything that we are. And we've got to be ready to do those things that God has called us to do. But complacency sets in. We get comfortable. And I say this because I'm, I, I, we, we sit on the same pews. Come on. We park in the same parking spots. Somebody sits in our pew. We, uh, we, want, to have a, we want to have a hissy fit. Yeah. They don't know. They're brand new. But we get complacent in where we are too. We get complacent in the prayer time. 
We would rather stay in line at Cracker Barrel than we would staying in an altar of repentance. You understand what I'm saying? Complacency will take you further than you ever want to go. It will get you into hell, but I'm here to tell you, you can get into hell, but you can never get out. You can never get out. But we, we get complacent in the things that we do. We get complacent in our prayers. We get complacent in our altar time. We get complacent in our study. We get complacent in, you know, living that example. Because you may go to another place in another town. They don't know who you are. But how do you act when you're not in the midst of all your brothers and sisters that are here? We get that complacency and we go, oh, that's somebody else. But I'm here to tell you, the prophet is saying that is you. Right. Amen. You are the man. Right. You're the one that's causing the issues. And I pray every time I say, Lord, let me not hinder the spirit. Yeah. Yes. Let me not hinder the spirit. Let me not one that hinders what you want to do. Because there's a lot of people that need to hear the truth being preached. There's a lot of, I'm telling you, there's a lot of men and women that stand behind pulpits, and I'm not here to bash the church. I'm not here to do that at all. I'm here to bash the sin that is being filtered through our churches and through the ones that are out there. That's what I'm here to bash. And I'm here to say that God is expecting you and I to stand up in a time and an hour right. where the world is falling deeper and deeper right. and deeper into sin yeah. and be a light into a lost and dark world right. that needs to hear the truth being preached to them. That's right. Do you know when I was a sinner and people would come up to me and, and, and I knew that they were preaching to me and it would step on my toes and I tell you, that's what they need to do now is step on some toes. There's some toes that need to be stepped on even in the church today because we're not doing the things that God has called us to do. See, that's why we wonder why the church doesn't have power anymore is because the church has gotten complacent in everything that it's done. Everything that they're doing and everything that they are is complacency in those things that we're seeing. Complacency in our, in our, in our prayers and our, our, our altars and even in our preaching of the gospel. But what are we doing to glorify Christ? What are we doing in our lives to do those things that God has called us to do? See, David was anointed in the beginning, knew what God needed him to do, and had been in multitudes of battles. I'm here to tell you, I guarantee if I asked you to raise your hand, you could say you've been in some battles yourself. You've been in some battles and some trials and some tribulations. You've had some victories. You've had some scars on your hands, some, some scars on those things that have, have caught some calluses that have caused you some pain because of those things that you've been in. But I'm here to tell you that God is, is going to look on those things and everything that we do and everything that we are. Right. He is looking for men and women to do those things. Let me read this. 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Yes. You can't dabble in sin right. or you'll be met with judgment. Everybody, every one of us are going to have to give an account. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to do that now than when you get in front of Him. It's going to do that if you're, if you're not here to worship, if you're not here to praise. Listen, it's not about Joey. Listen, I, 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 listen, I know that there's a, a million pastors, preachers, teachers better than, than this old boy standing up here. But I want to be a servant unto Christ. I want to be a servant unto Him regardless of, of what else is being said, regardless of those things that are out there. That's what I want to do. I don't want to stand in for Him and say, I asked you to preach. I asked you to teach. I asked you to talk to people on the street, and yet you didn't do it. That's not what I want to be. I want to be whatever God wants me to be. I don't want to be complacent in who I am. I know that I need to get closer. And I know that we all need to do that and have that respect as well. But God has called us to do the things. Once again, I told you I'm not going to keep you uh, very long tonight in, in the things that we are. But I want to talk about those sins and that things that, uh, you know, in John 10 and 10 it says, Satan is there, we know, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He will steal your victory. 
He will kill your passion for serving Christ. And he will steal your reputation as a Christian. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Amen. So is that we know that Satan is trying to steal everything that you got. Kill the passion that you have for Christ. I mean, when's the last time you worshipped just because you wanted to praise God? When's the last time you felt like, look, I can do what God wants me to do, whether I'm in church, whether I'm in front of somebody trying to impress them, or I'm in the presence of the Most High God. I want to praise and worship Him. But I'm telling you, when you get sin in your life, it compromises that worship. It, does, it hinders those things between you and God. And that's where we have to make sure is that we're doing the things. But David had gotten wearisome. He, all the battles that he had, he had quit walking in the Spirit. He started walking in the flesh. He was a mighty man, but yet he decided that he didn't need to have the things that everybody else. I'm not ready to go into the battles that everybody else is going to. I've had those trips. I've had those things. But the reality of it is, is David still needed Christ. Amen. And the great thing about it, and, and I'm, I'm, I told you I'm not going to keep you long. I, I want to I wanna get to the end here. But if you go back and you study those chapters, those 11 and 12 of where he killed Uriah. Nathan, it came to him and says, you're the man. Not only are you the man, but from this day forward, you're going to have that sword is going to be upon your family. Yeah. I was, years ago, I was talking to a truck driver, and I've told our Sunday school class this before, so they'll remember this. I told him, uh, I was talking to him and I was witnessing to him and he was so excited. He was so excited. He says, I just got saved. He was my age now. He was 50 years old. He says, I just got saved. And his happiness turned quickly into sadness. Tears started flowing down his face. Brother Corey asked him, he said, what do you, what, what's the matter? He says, I got saved. But the problem is, is that I lived in sin for 50 years. And my entire family has seen it. And yet, now they don't want to have any part of Christ. The sin that we have and the sin that we live in, not only will it affect you, That's right. but it will affect those that are around you. That's right. It will affect your children. It will affect your husband and your wife. It will affect your moms and dads. It will affect those that cause those things to happen. But the thing about it is that David repented. He received God's forgiveness. Everything that he had asked for, the consequence of his sin didn't go away, though. He still had to fight those battles. If you look in Psalms 51, David wrote this psalm out of these lessons out of 11 and 12. And the basic was, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. That's right. Don't cast me away from my sin. Blot out my iniquities before you. Cover them with your blood. Do the things that I've asked you to do. And I'm here to tell you this evening is that we still can, even though we may have messed up, even though things are around us and our families may be in struggling, sin may be running rampant in some of them, and the things, they may be running rampant in our lives. We can come to an altar and we can repent. We can come to an altar and that, that will be covered by the blood if we will give Christ everything that he has and everything that we are. See, see, the Lord doesn't need me to stand up here to show him how great he is. But what he does need is men and women to step out from the things of life, turn those things, as Brother Stephen said earlier, turn off my, my social media, turn off my Facebook, turn off my TV, Let's get back into what the power source. This is my power source. Amen. Facebook does nothing for me but waste time. This right here is never a waste of time. Amen. This gospel is never a waste for any man or any woman or any young person to get saved and born again. This is what God has called us to do. I'm telling you, we're running out of time. Amen. We're running. These days are getting shorter and shorter, and our time with the Lord is drawing nearer and nearer. And we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. I want my lamp to be full. 
I don't want it to be empty. I don't want him to say that I gave you an opportunity. I want him to say, well done, Amen. but I've got to do well in everything that those do. And I want you to understand that as we read that and we get ready to, to end up. I want to read this. If you will, just stand with me real quick, and I want to read this uh, as we get ready. In 2 Timothy, you, you can probably quote this as well as anybody else. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, it says, This is Paul. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me, but only but to unto, them, unto all of them also that love is appearing. So we can stay in sin and have the consequences of sin, which is death. Or we can fight the good fight of faith. There's a crown of righteousness laid up for you and I. If we stay in the fight and we stay in the battle and not get complacent in where we are at. I don't know about you, but I know that I need to get closer. I, don't, I, I need to draw near to him because we're still struggling with the things that we have. I still have family that are lost. I still have family that are bound. I still have family that are living in sin. And I need to get, do, get to be a doer of the word. I need to do those things that God has called us to do because I want to take them to heaven with me. I want my family to go. I want you to go. And I want to go as well. But I know that we've got to be doers of the word, be a, be, a, be, a, be a beacon of light into a lost and a dark world. If we could just take a couple of minutes, come to these altars, and let's ask God to deliver us. And if there's anything that's hindering us from doing the things that God has, ask him, to, ask him to reveal it to you. Ask him to show it to you, and he will do that. If you'll come in, let's have a time of prayer.